So the way we're going to uh, run this discussion, as opposed to, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about CDN Federation throughout the day, probably more than, certainly more than last year and more than previous years. So it's definitely a topic getting a lot of attention. Uh, we've heard about some of the technologies and trials that are out there, some of the um, systems that can help facilitate this ecosystem, marketplace, whatever you want to call it. I think what we tried to do in putting together this panel was take a look at the business of CDN Federation and what new models might develop and uh, what factors in the market might influence the success and or failure of CDN Federation. So a uh, group of folks from different companies, we'll all introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Barry Tishgart from Comcast. We've got Tony from Cisco, Peter uh, from Concentric, Ditlev from OnApp, and Huey from Conviva, and I'll let them introduce themselves, and then we'll go through a series of questions we talked about to, that we felt was important to uh, make some points about how the market's developing, where it's headed, and then we'll um, end about 15 minutes before the scheduled stop time and take questions from the audience. So that's, uh, fortunately, we don't have any more slides. Uh, we've seen enough of them. So uh, why don't we start with uh, Tony doing quick introductions, and we'll go down the line from there. Hi, I'm Tony Lapolito. I'm the Director of Product Management at Cisco. Um, I'm responsible for product management for what's called the Videoscape Distribution Suite, which is all of the products that are involved with delivering of content to devices on essentially any type of network, uh, mm -hmm. for any type of service, uh, to enable any type of business model. So things like CDN, caching, cloud DVR, et cetera, et cetera. It's all under my portfolio. And uh, hello, my name is Peter Papavasilio. I'm uh, acting, pre uh, acting president of Concentric Cloud Solutions and, uh, and vice president of marketing. And Concentric Cloud Solutions, we actually just launched uh, around a week and a half ago. We've got three main lines of business. One's what we call our cloud voice, which is like things like contact center as a service. Uh, the other is cloud computing, which is your virtual machines, storage, uh, managed, managed services, uh, disaster recovery, and, and then content, uh, content delivery. And with content delivery, we actually signed a uh, strategic partnership with, uh, with Limelight Networks, and we'll be talking about that a little bit as far as uh, the business of CDN goes. Yeah, my name is Dietlo Brodale. Um, I am the CEO of a business called OnApp. I'm from Denmark, that's why I carry this goofy name and accent. You have to get used to it by now. And um, we are fundamentally a, a cloud platform business, so we enable hosting companies to basically compete with Amazon. But since Amazon is more than just uh, EC2 nowadays, we also have a, a cloud uh, CDN platform. It's based on our acquisition of a business called Afflexi that we acquired about a year ago. And uh, it works, it's, it's a two federation really. It works across all the people that have OnApp installed, which is more than a thousand different hosting companies where we enable them to deploy CDNs, not only using their own infrastructure, but also the infrastructure of other on-app clients. We've been a business for about a few years, um, three years soon, and we have 110 employees, mostly out of uh, London, UK, but also here in the US. Hi, I'm Kui Zan. I'm a chief scientist and co-founder of Conviva. Uh, Conviva is a technology company helping uh, pop, uh, content publishers to optimize video quality. And we're doing that by optimizing at the application level, so on the you know, the points I'm going to talk uh, in here is that there is a CDN federation, but I think that the key here is the content has, there's a video and the rest of the traffic. And video is a very, very different beast. In fact, it's going to be, it's going to be a huge application for CDN federation, but the way to implement it can be very different from the traditional CDN federation, not, not necessarily at the networking level, or the DNS or HTTP level, but potentially the application level. And it requires extremely minimal uh, change to existing CDA infrastructure can still reap huge benefits. And so I hope I'm going to talk about that. Okay. Well, we were going to actually start out by talking a little bit about what a CDN federation is, but clearly I think this room has heard uh, a lot about that today, probably done a lot of your own research. But you know, we agreed that it's a concept of pooling resources among service providers. And you know, when you think about that, you know, th you get right to economics. I mean, if you talk about Sharing investment, sharing perhaps revenue, uh, who owns the customer? These are the kinds of questions that we wanted to examine in this panel versus spending a lot more time trying to define systems and platforms. So I think we're going to just go right there and um, maybe start with some discussion of 
the market realities of CDN Federation. And, you know, the concept has been out there for a while. The idea of sharing network resources has definitely been around in the telecom industry for a long time. And voice networks and um, ISPs have, have shared resources over time. So, you know, if you apply this to the CDN market, you know, I, I guess we'll start with this the basic question of, you know, if and when do you think CDN federations will be commonplace in the market? And I think perhaps also focusing a bit on the North American market as well, because there are some things happening at different paces around the world. You want to start, Tony? I think we're already seeing it happen. I mean, you know, when do you, you know, when do you consider the birth of anything? And what we're seeing, which is I think the most critical first step, is that virtually every service provider has decided that they need to build a CDN. And this is dramatically different than the way the world was three to five years ago. And once you have that CDN, whether you're offering retail service, you know, taking the content rights that you own and distributing to your own users, or doing other type of business models, including wholesale, et cetera, all of a sudden you start looking at, you know, how do I optimize this platform for revenue? And once you kind of make that leap from this is infrastructure investment to this is about you know, making a new business for myself, then you start forming relationships with other, with other groups. So it's happening. So when does it become reality? When is the tipping point? You know, I think that remains to be seen, but there are hard, you know, hard economic drivers that are, that are doing that. And if you look at the Cisco VNI uh, index of you know, traffic growth around video, you're seeing it's just exploding. So you know, the first step is you have a CDN, and then the second step is how do you optimize it? And obviously we see federation as a key thing of where you then, you're pooling your, your network resources, you're pooling your relationships, and you're creating essentially a network. And you know this notion of the CDN being overlay all of a sudden starts disappearing, and it looks more like the traditional internet. Yeah. It sounds like video is a key driver from your perspective. Um, that's well, absolutely, because it's just because the economics of both making money and the cost to deliver content. So we estimate it costs a service provider thirty-two cents to deliver a movie, which is you know when you're not making any money off of that, you have to say to yourself, how do I invest in infrastructure to lower that cost? Once you've done that, all of a sudden you say, okay, well, how do I make money off of that? And so that's the second tier, is how do I make money? And now I, now I start talking about how do I get more relationship with content providers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So video is the key driver, just because of the cost involved. And Peter, you were talking about perhaps there's some obstacles as well. <coughs> so Yeah, I mean, when I think of CDN Federation, um, you know, first off, uh, you know, I, I sort of define CDN, right? So for me, if you look at CDNs in general, the Bit delivery is the lowest margin business that they have out there. And site acceleration is the highest margin. And then you've got the over-the-top video platforms, right? Um, it, from my point of view, the DSA and, and the you know, your online video platforms, like the Bright Coves and the Uallas, are are actually driving a lot of the margins and a lot of the revenue. If you look at the video delivery, just the bit delivery, you know, even Akamai last quarter, you, they, their margins are even compressed as well, right? So. From my point of view, it's really around, you know, first off, you got to define the problem, the business problem, right? And so we know the business problem for the service providers. It's like, yeah, they're getting a lot of traffic and they're not monetizing it. But who's actually creating the problem, right? The, the people that are creating the problem are the people who, you know, the iPads, people downloading videos. And on top of that, though, um, the content owners aren't really motivated. So if you can have the best CDN in the world, but if you don't have content, you have no customers, you're not going to be, you need to, the, the service providers in my mind actually have to offer something different than what a traditional CDN is going to offer. And a content owner, um, and, and I think generally speaking, most of the discussions that I've seen and heard about on CDN Federation are really around we have to figure out a way to solve the content or the video problem. But there isn't as much thought or discussion around how do we actually provide a valuable service to the content owners to solve their problems. You know, you've got things, there's a ton, ton of problems you have to consider, like DRM, rights, security, token, authentication, the content security. All of those questions, reporting, analytics, there are some discussions, but when you really get down to how CDNs are actually integrated into the CMS systems for the video providers and how they secure the content, I think it's going to be, it's a much more challenging conversation than just service providers sharing resources. Not to mention some of the challenges service providers have as far as just turning up you know, links between each other, right? Now you're going to talk about you know, managing infrastructure between two different providers and what happens if you're multi-homed, who actually gets access to that uh, content and 
and how do you actually know that somebody is um, somebody serving that traffic and, and they take priority over somebody else? I just think there's a whole host more challenges than yeah. than we've seen. Sorry. So definitely, it's complex. <laughs> but I know Ditlev, your company is on the ground floor and trying to make make a market out of this space. No, but I, I agree with Peter that there is definitely an issue in terms of the onboarding and, and the integration of, the, of these uh, different service providers that needs to, yeah. to federate. And, uh, and, and this is a question of finding a common platform or finding a mirrored infrastructure and finding enough of it so you have a critical mass that you're able to integrate and, and federate across. And, um, and, and that's, that is definitely the entry barrier to this, to this market. There's no doubt about it. It is happening, though. I mean, as Tony said, it's happening. You, we're seeing it. We, we have several large deployments of CDN federations that have been around for half, almost some of them actually more than half a year. Um, and um, and from an end user perspective, the people actually d in front of the glass, yeah. it's totally transparent. So that they don't care how, how they deliver to them. They just want it as cheap as possible, as fast as possible. And if you look at the, the from a service provider's perspective, when I say service provider, and I think actually that would be yeah. the breakthrough here. Mm -hmm. When I say service provider, I also think about the hosting companies. It's a 16 billion, 60 billion dollar industry, whereas the CDN is what three billion, something like that. Right. And um, I can't see why, this should, why the CDNs are only sitting on, what, 10, 20 percent of the number of websites. I know they're sitting on 30 percent of the traffic because of Netflix and so on and so on. Right. But it's only around 30 percent of the websites out there that are actually powered by CDNs. In my world, it should be, well, not 100 percent, but perhaps at least a majority. And I think the reason it isn't is because it's not been spread out. It's never been scaled. It's always being sold by people in suits, with business cards, having phone calls and, and onboarding costs of $5,000 for a meeting and so on. I've been a hosting provider for what, 15, 20 years. I sold my business to Lloyds in UK last year, and I was reselling all of them. It was a fairly big business, I mean, around 70, 70 million of revenue. And um, I was reselling Akamai, I was reselling Limelight, Level 3, and I hated every second of it. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't resell them because I wanted to. I resell them because the, the cost for me to launch my own CDN was like $50 million. I need a data centers worldwide, I need intelligent hands, I need a software platform, and so on and so on. And you know what? The federation is the answer. If there had been a federative CDN where I could build my own CDN using the, what we had around 12 data centers I had, plus finding partners and an easy onboarding of those partners outside of my own infrastructure, if I could do that, I would never touch that client. Why would I? We were buying IP bandwidth, and we were buying uh, CDN from the same provider. I'm not going to say who it is because there's someone probably in this room and I paid like 10 bucks, this is a few years ago, I paid, I paid 10 bucks a megabit for my CDN bandwidth, but like $1 for my IP bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And from the CDN provider slash IP provider, it's more or less the same, same cost base. But the market has never been disrupted. And I think the, the federative approach is what's going to, to disrupt this market and hopefully spread it out ac ac across the uh, 80, 90 percent of the websites and services out there <coughs> rather than only the 10 percent uh, sort of elite of the websites out there. Right. But the problem you're discussing, if I may jump in. Yeah, sure. So, but the problem you're def you're discussing, right, is more in the business to business, right? Whereas the, the 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 business that you're referring to on the Cisco side, the Cisco side is really around, and, and to a large degree, Comcast, right? When you're a telco or a server, or, you know, there's telcos, and if you're a telco, your your biggest challenge is delivering bits to your subscribers, right? But you, what you're referring to is on more of the enterprise. Actually, actually not. I'm referring to that the internet in fundamentally is broken. I mean, it's, it's pretty funny that I'm sitting in London and if I have to, as an end user, yeah. uh, get a software update or, or download some uh, PDF files from someone who is in that top, top, top tier, I would have to pull that information across the pond. And that is because the internet is broken. It will remain broken as long as the prices for CDN is all, all the way up there. You said before that the... the, the well, the, you don't the, have to go across the pond to get the well, software download, right? It depends how it's, yeah, how it's exactly. structured, right? Yeah. But right. typically, it's not powered by CDN as it is, unless you are Microsoft, Apple, or someone like that, right? If I had to get my local software download, sometimes it's not on CDN, and that's just wrong. It's because the internet is broken. And what I'm, trying, what I'm talking about is really that the federative approach is what's going to fix it. You spoke about the, the, yeah. the margins before. I mean, in the hosting world, you work with like 8 to 12% margins, which sounds crazy for most CDNs, because uh, even though ma the margins have been squeezed, and mm -hmm. even in Akamai, yeah. it, they're way higher than that. So. Yeah. It's really, from a hosting perspective, the $60 billion industry is the last place with any sensitive, sensitive margins in it. So, so actually, if you take what you've, you've said, you take it a little bit kind of to the extreme or to the end game, doesn't the delivery of content just become a commodity like absolutely. any other commodity? Yep, absolutely. And so, you've, so you've based, if you're the service provider, your problem today is I'm getting a flood of, flood of video and it's costing me money because I have to keep driving up my, you know, I have to keep driving network upgrades. You get to a certain point, though, 
And now I've built out the infrastructure. I can deal with my own traffic. But now all of a sudden I have excess capacity. The content provider, again, going back, it's transparent. They don't care where they, how it's good. So now all of a sudden I want to deliver content. Well, if I'm a service provider, I've built out the infrastructure. Now I can sell that excess capacity. Not only do I have my own retail customers I deal with, I'm going wholesale, I'm pulling in additional content providers. Now I have excess capa capacity. So it's now it becomes a free market. It's taken to the extreme. Doesn't it become like a content brokerage? Yeah. Where, yeah, I, like where, yeah, where, where I just insert it, and now I can distribute it on a worldwide basis, set my policy, and now I have people bidding on, you know, give me the lowest price. I've solved the cost problem as a service provider. Now I'm into the profit side of the business. Good. And we'll talk about economics for sure. I wanted to let uh, Huey talk about you know, where he sees the market going. Because you, you offer an enablement solution to this, right? Yeah. And I, you know, one of the things, there's a lot of uh, sort of service provider-centric view of the world. So first of all, I have a problem, which is that you know, traffic coming to me, I have to deal with that. And uh, you know, I, I, how do I avoid the you know, down pipe? There's a lot of that kind of uh, perspective. So what I want to talk a little bit about is from the content publisher's perspective. And I think the content publisher, you know, this is, this I'm more familiar with, and that's our, our customer base, and many of them are going global. But that's the great thing about internet. Internet is basically pr pr promise that you can distribute content to any of your audience anywhere. So, but the, the reality is, obviously, it's not like that. So now. Uh, now, it's more and more the content publishers going to global. You know, we see Netflix and going to uh, international markets, BBC going global, CNTV from China going global. Um, that uh, one of the things they want to ensure the quality you know, to their customers and also in, in achieve the scalability. Now, today's solution, you know, we can talk about you know, those sort of federations today. Now, those solutions, you know, you know, you're, Barry, you're asking, you know, where the state of our deployment is. I think that if you rely on the, at the heart, you know, at the, at the service provider level integration, just like we're gonna build the internet of the CDNs, that's years out. And, but, you know, the publishers want that today. So yeah. what Conviva has built as a solution is that, you know, we build an application level integration solution. And the key here is that video is application level, you know, sort of a usage. And they have a very intelligent piece of software already on the client. It's called the video player. So you can deploy a capability in that video player to in interconnect uh, CDNs together and provide a uniform services. And uh, one of the key things we also see that the big challenge is diversity. You know, every, the, the, their patches, CDNs sometimes works good in this region but not working in the other region. Diversity is a challenge but also it's opportunity. The, the good thing about the, the world, again, the internet world is a logical network. In fact, you really can reach any CDNs from any place. So you can actually pick the best path if you have a multiple CDNs operated by multiple providers. And I think at that level of integration not only increase your footprint and, and the reach, but also tremendously improve your quality of experience. <coughs> so that's really how, from the content publisher's perspective, I think that they see the huge benefit. And that deployment is happening today uh, on the video side. All right, good. Well, I think we should jump into the economics of this a little bit because, you know, you have a... Uh, Three fairly different constituents in the market today between the uh, can't see the other side of the room the service providers the uh, content owners and publishers and um, uh, seat traditional CDNs and so when you talk about changing who pays whom for what and you you know you talk about the, the significant investments each party has to make to keep up with the trends in the market um, more content being available more network investment to support video and you know, more server and storage build out. Now, how do you see that model developing and how do you think that the economics can be shared and do you see these very different constituents cooperating in a federated model? So actually I think it's, I see it almost as an unholy alliance that exists today. Unholy is probably a strong word. But there's, a, there's interdependencies on all three parties. The content, provide, content providers typically rely on the CDNs to deliver their content. The CDNs rely on the service providers to actually get to the end user. And essentially the um, service provider relies on the end user. So what you have is these, you know, this, this flow of, of money that starts with the content, provi content provider gets money from the end user and then it flows back down. The only problem today is service providers not getting any of that other than they get their you know, internet access fee every month which those prices are being driven down by triple play and whatnot. 
and they're not receiving any of the money. So, and they have to keep upgrading their infrastructure. So, what has to happen is there has to be a, a, a model that now that all three of them can share. Because think about it, content provider doesn't care how the, the bits get there as long as you know they get there at a reasonable price and good you know and user quality experience. The CDN provider essentially has the relationships with all of the content providers. Those are pretty much locked up. And if you think about more, you know, Metcalf's law of networking, if I'm Disney, I'm not, do I want to go out and form a relationship with, you know, a thousand content provider, uh, CDNs? No, I want to be able to go in one place and get worldwide distribution. CDN provider has no motive to share that money with, with the service provider. So you have to break that mold. And it has to be done in such a way that you get, you capture the value that you provide. And so taking it to the extreme of the, of the brokerage thing, the brokerage concept, con content comes in with a certain policy. I want this worldwide, or I want it to be distributed in North America. I want it to be distributed in, Alaska, in um, Australia. Then the brokerage then creates a relationship and puts it out for bid. Now all of a sudden, the pure play or the brokerage top level now works with the service providers and they share in the revenue. To me, that's the only way it makes sense. Because otherwise, there's no motive for change. And now you're just going to end up with a, with a war where everyone's trying to take each other's customers and whatnot. So to me, it's, it is that revenue share. Any, any other thoughts? Yeah, so um, I, 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 uh, I'm having a hard time actually seeing it work practic as a practical matter, actually seeing it take off and actually work. So uh, I think, Tony, you were around maybe 15 years ago when there was when Ink to Me was around, and then there was Cisco had their, uh, what was it called at that time? Cisco. ECNS? Yeah, something. Yeah, web oh, co con uh, they, they, content. Cisco developed some product protocol, web caching content protocol. Oh, WCCP, uh, WCCP yep. Yeah, yep, WCCP. Yep. Well, I think you talked about the uh, content alliance. Yeah, and was there was like a content alliance and there was content exchange, and this was around 15 years ago, and um, it, it was fundamentally the same concept, which was a bunch of service providers were going to get together and they were going to exchange traffic. And you know how that worked out, <laughs> right? It didn't. <laughs> But you know, very candidly, it didn't work out. And I, I, part of the reason it didn't work out is because you're asking, you know, number one, you're, the, the model, the business model is not really well defined. Who's paying whom? You keep hearing this, the, the content owner is going to pay an entity. Well, which entity? Why are they going to choose one entity versus another entity, right? So fundamentally, I still see significant challenge. And then, that, then there's a contracting issue, and then there's SLAs and credits, and who do you hold accountable if there's a... Uh, SLA violation, right? Um, and again, we're talking primarily on um, the bit delivery side of the house, not on the site acceleration side or the uh, you know the video platform or mobile acceleration, right? Um, but still, I think they're fundamentally you still have the problems. That there isn't a lot of clarity around who's going to pay whom and where is the contracts and, and what are the what are the issues and and how do you solve issues and ramifications? Want to take questions now, Ooh. Barry, or you want to wait? I uh, think you need to. <laughs> why don't we go through the line and then we'll right, stop right, for questions? Right. And then, um, and that, so that's that's one big that's one big issue. And then I do think you know at the end of the day, this is what I said earlier. What problem are you solving for? The CDN business today, the, the service providers really care about controlling your costs. You said it's thirty two cents to deliver a video thing, right? That that, that they're not getting monetized for. The service providers, for the most part, don't really care about a mom and pop shop that does, you know, 20 video streams a month, right? Um, th that's not really what their concern is. Their concern is around optimization. And when you think about what their concern is, that the CDN business as a whole, you know, it's 1.3 billion on a global basis, 12,000, approximately 12,000 customers worldwide. That's not really interesting to like a Comcast who does, a, you know, I don't even know what the revenue is nowadays, but you know, a billion and a half isn't really you know, that overly interesting to a company like a Comcast or a T Systems, right? So again, from my point of view, you really have to define the problem you're trying to solve. Um, I do personally think actually CDN Federation has, a, if you're a telco and you own the majority of the cons uh, the subscriber base, um, like a like a Telefonica in Spain or a Telstra in Australia. Um, and, and maybe even in China with China Telecom, there are certain areas that when you control the end users um, and you can control sort of what they view or in the capacity they view, I do think you've got a lot more leverage than you do in countries like the States. So, um, I, you know, there are certain areas where I think CDN Federation makes sense. In the U.S., since we're talking specifically in the U.S., I, I find it very challenging uh, when you think about just, the, just how many service providers we have, how many telcos we have, 
The educational institution represents 10 to 20 percent of the total internet traffic. The enterprises represent a significant amount of internet traffic. So as a global, as a U.S.-based uh, federation, in my opinion, is really significantly challenged um, uh, across the board. There's one thing I want to comment a little about based on what happened 15 years ago. Is when, we went to the, <laughs> when we went to the service providers back then, they were like, why do I want to build a CDN? I have a ho all this hosting infrastructure. And I think the difference now is, is that because of the video challenge, they are building CDNs. And I do think it becomes, the CDN dissolves as just part of distributed hosting. It becomes part of that. And now yeah. all of a sudden, you, there is that reason to exchange so, content. I, I, I think yeah, one of the problems is it's, it's been sold account. the wrong way. Yeah. I mean, if, if you go to, the, to the, the typical client at my old business, or if you go to any clients at Rackspace or software clients or something like that, they wouldn't have a CDN, even though they probably should. Mm -hmm. Their services wouldn't be powered by a CDN. The site acceleration, the in-app uh, acceleration, or even the, the, basic, um, the basic CSS on image files would not be served by a CDN, but they should be. And the reason they aren't is because the price is too high. And the reason the price is too high is because it's not a functional marketplace. And I think as soon as you create a functional marketplace, you'll have all sorts of advantages. You'll have an advantage in terms of, of yeah, price will get lower, but you will also have pubs where you normally wouldn't see. I, we have a pub in Iceland. We have like 10 pubs in Africa. That doesn't work in the normal uh, CDN business model because someone would look at Iceland and say, well, there isn't a lot of people there. There isn't enough public uh, what, what's the density of, of, yeah. of people there in order to justify having a CDN. But in the federation world, that pub has already got its own business model around its hosting. So adding CDN to it is really, really easy. So it, it, it just changes the whole, the whole sort of mechanics out of it. And f just from a CDN perspective, if you're a traditional CDN player, you would want to do this as well. Some of our best clients, like a company like Pier One, is a client of us. And they had 22 pubs already. But they didn't have anything in Asia, didn't have anything in Iceland or Africa or South America. They only had their 22 pubs distributed over US and Europe. But u using the federative approach, they would go and use their own, their own infrastructure and then add the pubs they'd like to. So and what's the difference between that and just giving them some resource, some, some infrastructure on your resources? That's, in my book, what a federation is. So, so let me uh, just say, so say what well, Peter, Peter is a skeptic, but I'm saying what, what's what changed in 15 years. So I think the first thing is that uh, there's a, you know, the consolidation of 2080 rule still applies, meaning that, you know, if you look at this country, you know, even this country probably is more fragmented, uh, you know, service provider, you take the top five service provider, it covers, you know, 70% of the population. Now, the question here is, that's also is the majority of what the problem is. So that's where, when we say the service provider has a problem, that where they have congestion, that's where that 70% those consumers were facing, and that's the service provider facing. That's so happens, the same thing was when in the morning Telefonica says, you know, to really scalable distributed video, you need to push the service all the way to the baseline level. You cannot move it all the way, at the, you know, sort of in the, in the national backbone level. But that's just not going to be very economical. So now, that's what we're talking, so it's going to be, uh, you know, for every country, even in large countries like uh, here, that we may have, you know, ISP-based CDNs that maybe there are, you know, uh, two handful of them, um, but you will have other, other overlays cover the other part of the, the customers. So you always have the overlays that take care of the rest of the, the traffic. And, uh, you know, this great thing about, again, the CDN versus the ISP uh, is that the CDN is a virtual service. Even though I'm in SBC's network, I can access the server in Comcast, except the performance is going to be bad. But the, the fact that I can access any server is a huge plus because that can have 100% coverage. The rest is, is good coverage. So anybody can add more servers in their network, and, and so you can have a mechanism to stitch them together. Well, overall, enhance the, the capability of the you know is uh, the entire network. It's actually incentive compatible in the sense that both the ISP will benefit, and we need to link it all the way to the, you know, all the content publishers, and, and the whole ecosystem benefit. I think that that's a very strong, uh, you know, sort of incentive compatible uh, uh, system that we, I think that what happened, compared to the 15 years ago, we never had the kind of traffic driver, and the p content publishers have the, the viable economic models, which we have today. So what? Why don't we throw it open to the audience for a few questions? And I think we heard some, some good topics here on you know a functional marketplace, video being the driver, and some just barriers to success that that it, you know the cooperation and collaboration hasn't always been there, and there's more there's more technical challenges, but there are opportunities. So we can start right down here with the first question. Thanks, sir. I just had a question for um, Peter and Dipa. Um, oh, I got the name right. Yeah, yeah, you got it. <laughs> um, what, what would you say is the um, 
sell through for CDN services for your typical cloud customer? Like if someone's spending $100 with you guys, how much are they spending on CDN installation? And, and, and by the way, can you repeat the question before you start the answer? No, no. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So the, the question was, um, as a typical client, paying 100 bucks for whatever service they're buying, how much would they add on top for CDN services? Is yes, that, yeah. Exactly. I, yeah, okay, so, so the, the, question, the answer is way too little. Because <laughs> <laughs> if, if you look at it, and, and you, your point was very good with Comcast, right? They wouldn't get out of bed for that sort of, of yeah, 2 no, billion yeah. revenue. But that's because it's being sold the wrong way. It's been sold as this content delivery magic that no one really understands. So the way that we sold it in my old business, was we, when, when someone bought a server from us, we asked them, all right, cool, so you bought this server, it's in a data center in London. Do you have clients outside of London? You know, most people will say, yeah, otherwise they wouldn't buy a whole server, right? So, all right, so where are they? Are they in Europe? Are they in US? Or are they in, in Asia? Well, you know what? I have some clients in Europe. I have some clients in Japan. All right, that's cool. Listen, we'll add a copy of your content, the most access content. We add a copy of it in, in US. We'll add one in or wherever it was that they said they had uh, clients. And then we click deploy. Another 100 bucks a month per, per edition. That can't be done with a standard CDN because the standard CDN is like a one size fits all. But having a federation, you can sort of build bespoke setups where you can choose, all right, you know what, I only want Tokyo and Helsinki. And sort of suddenly this whole sort of, sort of uh, pick and choose methodology that, that, that a federation gives you, gives you whole new opportunities. And hopefully we will stop talking about this at the end, but it will just be the way stuff is done. So it will be hopefully the, what's the typical bandwidth cut of, of, of a, a client right now in, in my old business would be like 20, 30% of my revenue. That 20, 30% should sit in the CDN's world. It shouldn't be sitting in my internal data center world. It should be delivered through the, through the content delivery network. And you know what, if you, if you build a functional marketplace, there will be price parity. Because why should the CDN bandwidth be more expensive than normal bandwidth? You know, typically it's actually cheaper because you can peer most of it. It's always sitting just next to the user, so you're able to peer it. Whereas transit deliveries going across the pond would be more expensive. So, uh, answer, so you know, from my point of view, I agree with Ditlip that uh, they're not spending enough with us just yet, right? So, um, you know, Concentric is a division of XO. We've got, I think, around approximately 90,000 customers, and every single one of those customers is going to be, you know, is a candidate for CDN services, right? So what we've done is, um, fr from our point of view, as I mentioned, the, you know, you've got the, the pure play CDN providers out there who are really focusing on the larger bit delivery, uh, you know, companies, right? So the ones that really move the needles, the Netflix, the uh, ESPNs, the Disney's of the world, right? And so from the concentric point of view, we've got um, we've got bundles that we uh, they start that start off as low as around forty nine dollars a month, and go up until really custom, uh, customized opportunities, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per month. But our, our point, from our point of view, is we really want to actually um, offer products and services to the small, mid-sized customers, because I do agree with Detlev as well that um, there really hasn't been a focus on the smaller, mid-sized customers. For, for CDN, you know, content acceleration, mobile delivery, um, and, and even to a large degree, bit delivery and video platform delivery. Um, so um, that's a big focus of ours going forward. Um, we're not looking to try to get into, you know, the, the it's kind of interesting, C, uh, when you talk about CDNs, with, with your you know telcos, they're real you know the majority of them are primarily thinking about how do I solve my on net problem, right? Like how do I actually deliver these? You know, uh, cost me thirty two cents now. I want to serve it. Uh, I want to serve it for ten cents because I'm not getting any money for it. From our point of view, we're looking at it, the CDN federation differently, which is how do we actually get uh, you know the global distribution that we can offer to our customers um, and giving them price points and making them easy to consume our services, and that's really our big focus. And, you know, because there is 12,000 customers, CDN customers or so, whatever it is around the world, and think of there's millions of websites, and they're all candidates for CDN mm. services. And that's really our focus. It should be a $2 billion business. Yeah. It shouldn't be a $2 billion business. Right. Right. Yeah. Are there questions on? Yeah. Right, Michael. Good question. So um, we want to start turning in way, maybe pick it up. But I mean, it was about you know, really who owns the customer, who owns and manages the customer relationship, and then how does billing and settlement work? Given, especially if you're going a, across a true federation, where take for the U.S. for instance, maybe it's you know split in quarters. I'm almost more interested in the first thing, something that bigger than settlement. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, so I think you know, I think one of the things that really is slowing down the market, but has built the market the way it is, is the fact that the the pure play CDNs own the relationship with the content providers today. And so mostly what we're seeing in the, that are being built are retail CDNs. So I own, I'm Comcast, I'm gonna deliver my own content that I have rights to. Um, if I'm one of the pure plays, I have a relationship with the big, the big guys that are delivering content. So I think what happens there in any business model is whoever I have the relationship with as a content provider is the, is the throat to choke. And that remains to be you know, the same. The underlying technology has to enforce SLAs, you, know, you may say, hey, I want to deliver my content now to Malaysia. A local uh, CDN or service provider would have a, relation, a federated relationship with Malaysia. They would basically say, okay, I want to, what, what type of quality of service do you want to deliver in Asia? Is it best effort? Is it premium, et cetera? That SLA is negotiated at a, technical, at a business level <coughs> by the person who owns the primary relationship. It is then enforced by you know, the, the underlying technology. At the end of the day, though, Whoever the content provider has a relationship with is who they, whose choke, you know, whose, whose choke, whose throat they choke. The reality of it is, though, um, is that the, that brokerage type relationship that they talked about, where I now say, here's my here's my movie. I want to distribute. You know, where do the right, where do I want to distribute rights to this globally? Is I do not want to have, you know, ten, you know, a thousand relationships or even a hundred relationships with, with CDNs. I want to have one relationship. And they deal with my distribution. So whether I'm a brokerage that owns a lot of infrastructure, or if I just act as like a stock exchange and I decide where do I put stuff, buys and sells. Again, I own the relationship with the content provider, and that's where the buck stops, in my opinion. Anyway. Uh, I, I think that you know, sort of. Uh, let, let me give you a case study and sort of uh, saying how, how this works today in the simplest form. You know, we we uh, let's take a customer. Uh, let's take any, let's say ESPN. Let's say. That they already because their content is so critical that they they already own multiple relationships directly with the CDNs directly. Now the key question you ask the SLA question. Well, hold on. So the key question you ask is very. They, they will hold their all their CDNs accountable. Now the question here how we ask this question a long time. It's just like collecting tax. How do we collect tax in Greece versus collect in the United States? The first thing you collect tax, you be able to count and verifiably count. If you cannot count, you cannot enforce SLAs. Because we, you know, five years ago, you say, how do we enforce SLAs for CDNs? You know, CDN tell you what's the, you know, what's the performance. You're not going to have SLAs. But today, we have the technology today. We can measure every video stream every second from the end system perspective, independent of the CDNs. Now we have the capability to count. Now all of a sudden, we can enforce the, the SLAs on a per CDN basis. So once you have that capability, the question here is, now, you know, once you see that, the truth is nobody can hold up to the scrutiny of that camp, that measurement. The, the, because the internet is best for internet. You know, despite of all of our smartness that there's variation in there and the quality is not subject to the kind of experience we want to have. So the key here is how do you build interesting services and predictable quality services on diverse inter uh, CDNs. That's what we're coming back to saying, once you have multiple CDNs in the federal CDN model, you actually have this opportunity to take advantage of diversity <coughs> And pick and in fact build a more predictable service yeah. on top so of that, and that's a value-added service. Now we're not talking bit services anymore. I'm not talking about how many bits transmit. I'm saying, well, you used to be your consumer watch a video episode that they watch stay there for 10 minutes. Now with a better experience, they watch stay on 15 minutes. Now it's a business value because you just so happened to sold two more ads. Now I convert that to a business value conversation. So again. You know, how do you, there, there's a SL, SL level, SLA level issue, but you need the fundamental capability of counting. And I think that it's very different to do transient SLA enforcement. Today's big customers, you know, for our customers, they actually enforce directly on those uh, CDNs. We gave them a means to do that. And then, but that is not the, the end game because you enforce it, it's still not good enough. The only thing you can get is maybe get some refund. But you want your consumers to have a good experience you really have additional mechanism optimization techniques to put in there. And that's where I think the federal CDN gave you that kind of opportunity. All right. Uh, Brian, in the back there uh, against the wall. Yep. Do you have a question? Yeah. Big question about monetization. What's the money stream? Is this yeah. a lot of good work question. that you were talking about? So this guy's got to pay this guy, got to pay this guy, got to pay this guy, got to pay that guy. They got credits and settlements all the way back to the path. It's too complicated to do. So we're trying to do it. 
Yeah, so the question was really, follow the money. How does the money yeah. flow work from end to end? And so, uh, talking yeah. about a functional I marketplace. I guess it depends on business model to business model, right? Yeah. In our case, we have a marketplace um, where people will go to their dashboard inside of the on-app portal. So people here would be service providers who wants to build their own CDN. It could be a bespoke CDN for a single client, or it could be a general one-size-fits-all CDN. They will go in, they will fund their account with, what, a thousand bucks or whatever they want to start out with. They would then pick the pubs they'd like. They could be, they wanted, you know, some pubs in Africa, some pubs in Europe, or some pubs in the U.S., or whatever they want. And, um, and then we'll click the apply. But and, I, but I think, and, know, and then the money is going. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so we did a study with this at Cisco. Right. And so take your typical, you know, long-form piece of content. It's, you know, say five, six gigabytes of, of data to get delivered to, to, to a consumer. Depending on how you buy that, whether you buy a monthly subscription to something like Hulu Plus or YouTube, or you're buying a la carte, or even if you're getting free stuff. Essentially, the end user has some relationship with the content provider, whether they're watching ads or they paid a subscription, or say they pay $5 for a movie online. So that, the, the end user pays the content provider for that in some form, or the, or the rights holder. In turn, unless you're, unless you're one of the big boys like Netflix, et cetera, you're paying anywhere from five to eight cents a gigabyte to deliver that content. So say you're at the you know, extreme end of that, you're paying, you know, it's eight, it's eight cents. So you're paying, you know, 50 cents or so, 60 cents to the, 50 cents to the pure play CDN. That now they buy bandwidth from the service provider, which is, you know, fractions of that. And then the, con the service provider is now paying for that same, for that same content delivery where they're receiving almost zero revenue. And actually, in some cases, they're, they're giving the bandwidth to the content providers because it's helping them. They're paying about 32 cents to deliver that same piece of content. So whatever gets paid, say $5 for a movie, about 10% of that goes to the pure play CDN, about 50 cents, and then nothing goes to the service provider where they're incurring a cost of 30 to 40 cents to deliver that same piece of content. And that's in essence why service providers are building CDNs now is to, they, they can drop that price in half to do the delivery from, from 32, 40 cents down to 15, 20 cents. That's their primary motiv motivation. Once you talk about federation, now you say, okay, I get a relationship with the content provider. Now I can capture the revenue stream. I can get that 50 cents that they're paying the pure plays. So that's how the money flows today and how they envision it flowing. Well, it is, it is a big fundamental question because it is nice to talk about increasing the size of the CDN market. It's nice to talk about enabling smaller websites or smaller business. But you know, I think we hit on it earlier that that may not be the, the central issue here. There's a large investment that has to go in. There's a structured marketplace today, and I think that Liv, you hit it. If we had a functional marketplace to uh, handle these types of transactions, handle the billing in SLAs, um, have a model whereby carriers or, and CDNs could settle with one another in a fair way, you know, then, you, then you have what many people envision to be a true federated CDN, but it doesn't seem, seems like we're missing several, if not more, of those pieces today. And um, I think that's what we you know, might conclude as a panel, even though nobody said it, I think there's a lot of opportunity but it, the pieces are missing. So how long do we have that function in marketplace, Ditlev? I mean, I, in, I mean in a big there. way. Not, I mean, there's quite a few of them. It's, it's there, but I don't yeah. see too many service providers or CDNs in the U.S. Yeah. who I, serve that big traffic being a part of it. I, I think, I, if You're, I may, Barry, um, yeah. I, I think that, you know, there's two extreme form of it. You know, it's just we think about the network, there may be, you know, N degrees of redirections. You know, you may have a long chain of money changes. But the reality is, is that change is going to be extremely flat. I mean, that's going to be short. So the whole m marketplace will be very flat because there's, yeah. there's uh, you know, in my view, there will be the sort of the Verizon, the Comcast, you know, the SBC of the world, they will build their own CDNs just because they have economy of scale and the true capability and the problem to solve. And then there's overlay CDNs like the Limelight, the, 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 the sort of the, the level three and, and, and the outcome of the world the, the, the retrofit that. And then for our big publishers, they can actually go to one level. They can sign out a contract. They, we're talking about handful of contracts to sign. We're not talking about you know sort of hundreds of contracts to sign. And then you can sign that contract with them. So that's a one level. You immediately and you enforce those uh, SLAs. And the key here is you, you, what the business has changed is you do not have minimum commit. And this is where you enable this CDN federation. That's a key business driver today. Is that. Now, if you if you have to sign out five contracts with minimum commit, your that your life will be miserable. Versus right now, you say is use this based charging on that five CDNs, and whoever performs the best, you know, I will give the traffic to it. Now that's give a huge a power to the content publishers. 
and also to drive the market to be more efficient, align the interest because everybody needs to strive to provide better service. In fact, they enable uh, AT&T of the world saying, well, in my network, I can really make my subscribers' quality much, much better. And, and that's where the traffic, in fact, will flow there because mm -hmm. you know, I can actually see that as at and CDN can sub sub serve 18 sub subscriber better. So just one, one comment on that. So just, um, you know, the CDN market, we all, we all already said it's relatively small, rel you know, relatively speaking to the Comcast, the Verizons of the world, right? So the question that you actually have to ask yourself is how do you actually increase the size of the pie, right? And you're not going to really increase the size of the pie by dropping the price by 50%. Right, you may have more bits that are delivered, but still, you're going to have to, you know, th that math doesn't work, right? That doesn't increase the revenue. So, what the service providers, in my opinion, actually have to try to consider is, how do we, how do we actually expand that pie? Do we offer uh, guaranteed Turbo Boost offerings for for delivering, uh, you know, movies? Can I, uh, you know, if I make, if I somehow can cut a deal with Netflix for bringing their content closer, can I, uh, you know, get some kind of a revenue share by offering them? You know, uh, consumers. You know, the question is, how do you actually go to the consumer and increase the revenue share that way? If you offer them a two dollar package per month for all for all the movies to deliver on that, right? Uh, and you can guarantee delivery um, within you know a fraction of the time that it takes to get the, the content from a Netflix, right? That's off net. You know, will, would somebody be willing to pay an extra two dollars per movie? That's really, in my opinion, how you're actually going to grow the pie, not by delivering bits faster. It's going to be. You have to think a little bit creatively on like, what is the value to the consumer? Because that's ultimately, you can, if you're a Comcast and you get an extra two dollars per subscriber, that's per month. That's really interesting, as opposed to, you know, uh, you know, ten cents for uh, for a movie versus uh, fifteen cents per movie, right? Because a lot of it's optimization for the Comcast, as opposed to if you start increasing the subscriber revenue, that's monetization. That's a good point. Yeah, and, and, and I think that just to Peter's point, it just built on top of that. I think that's where you have the potential non-linear non narrative between cost and, and the price. For example, today everybody can deliver all the CDN two megabits per second to your home. But you know, if we say, well, I have an eight, eight megabits per second version of it, and that's going to charge the additional two dollars more. In fact, only the guys on net can deliver that kind of service if cost effectively, and that's where how you get the incentive aligned. Good. Uh, maybe one more quick one. We are, yeah, running out of time. So right, right there. So one more, one, one question more. Is that we're, so when you go over time, and whether it's the end, yeah. so what else can happen if it's not the When does it all happen? We've, we've tried to answer that question. But there are some drivers, but let's do, let's do like maybe five word answers for each of us. <laughs> <laughs> Start with Tony. Yeah, lightning round. Uh, I, I think it's happening now, as I said, and I believe that you know it's not going to be the Big Bang thing. It's going to be evolution, you know, and it's just a matter of time. And I'll just I'll leave you with one thought, which I think is really interesting. I got a deal that came across my desk two weeks ago, and I said, hmm, "Why is this customer going to buy Cisco CDN? It was a big content provider." And I dug into it a little bit deeper. They're building a six-node CDN. Hmm. I thought about this a little bit more. Didn't take too much to figure out what was going on. They're going to put basically a six-node CDN. Where are they going to put those six nodes? Right at the edge of all the service providers, the Comcast, the Time Warners, the Verizons, because the world is broken the way it is. And they want to change that. So they're not waiting for federation. So it will either happen by the, serv the content providers doing it on their own or by um, a federation model you know, popping up. It won't be Big Bang, but it will be things like that that will change the way things are done. By the way, they want to bypass the pure play. Is essentially their motivation. So uh, I don't think we'll ever see it play out to the degree people are Start thinking it will play out. Right. So I think you're going to see pure plays work with service providers, uh, and that's actually I do agree that's actually happening now, where pure plays are offering their infrastructure out in different regions for for the service providers. I think that mm -hmm. that is happening now. Um, you know, as far as uh, um, you know, global. Peter, uh, Oh, we're asking us to cut us off. So quick, right. quickly, any other? Yes, I think it's happened already. I mean, well, there's guys already. like, uh, All right. I said that a few it's times, there's guys like us, there's uh, xdn.com, there's onapp.com, there's, uh, you, you, Edgecast is doing it right now, there's uh, High Winds uh, Federation Initiative. It's, yeah. it's right there. It just Maybe takes time. Maybe that's part of the problem. There's a lot of, yeah. So the key is which level interconnection we're talking about. At, at, the, at the ISP level interconnection, because of technology and deployment, that's going to be years away. But at the application level, 
is happening today and happened already to many, many content publishers. So this happening this already today. It's all about which level you interconnect. Okay, and I'll go with 18 months on the high side. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for the panelists. It was a very interesting and lively conversation. Thanks.